So my name is Ryan Whirl, and I'm here to talk to you today about how to build anything with FoundationDB. I know that sounds a little nuts. I can't, it can't be literally everything, because I'm only here for a half hour. But I want to provide you with some ideas and some inspiration to tell you that even if you're not super familiar with FoundationDB today, that you can you know, dream up things that you can do in the future. And I want to give you the foundations of, of just like, how do you use keys and values to do stuff? And we're going to do that uh, with two examples today. The first one will be modeling what looks like a relational database schema, which you are all very familiar with by now after all the talks today about the record layer. And uh, some of the details were in the uh, CouchDB layer as well. And the second problem is how to add features to an existing distributed system that doesn't provide super strong guarantees. And we're going to do that by adding uh, consistent object listing, basically removing some of the problems with Amazon S3. So when you, when you start using FoundationDB, you, you get, um, you're basically dropped into a world with nothing, and you have to figure out what to do yourself. It's not quite literally nothing because you have the tuple layer, but uh, it's not a whole lot. And I think this is a quote from Dave Scherer. I'm not entirely sure. I think it's from the first open source thread on Hacker News when Foundation UV was released. And this is the best description I have ever seen of what it feels like to use FoundationDB. Um, what I want to do today is give you the hammer and the nails with which to take those two by four framing studs and build a house or a database. An alternative way to look at it is you get some Lego, which is a little bit more fun than building a house. So, when we're talking about databases, I think we should, you know, I, I want to do some definitions first um, and, and, you know, kind of map out where things fit. And on that screen, the D probably doesn't come across as, as vi uh, vibrantly as it is on my screen, but those are it's divided between uh, blue and pink. And what we're going to be talking about today is basically C in ACID. FoundationDB does the other stuff for you. Um, so what is... You know, I, you have to talk about this for a second. I'm not talking about the C and the cap theorem. That's not what I'm talking about. You, you know this. This is not what this talk is about. Uh, this is really not relevant for the first half. It'll be slightly more relevant for the second half. But again, really, not really. That's not the C I'm talking about. Um, this is the C I'm talking about. Your program brings the database from one valid state to another. Emphasis on your program. This is your job. So even, you know, even if you're just building uh, like a Rails app on top of a SQL database, it is still your job, at least partially. And you need the A, I, and D from ACID in order to do this. And my, my experience in the real world is that da data corruption is a, is a combination of bad application code, as in bugs that you all write in your programs, and bad databases. And I'm sure you've all experienced both. Um, some problems are a bit hard to track down, whether it's one or the other, but uh, it's, it's definitely a combination of the two. And hopefully, FoundationDB gets rid of the bad databases part. So it's just your bad code that's the problem now. You've got to fix that. So most databases provide you with a few things in the C realm, um, other than A, I, and D, which I already mentioned. Uh, the most important one, I would say, is no false positives or negatives from index lookups. That one you kind of need if you have indexes. Um, but again, if this is your layer, that's your job. Uh, schema management, like inserting and indexing records, uh, and some elements of type checking. Not all databases do that, but a lot of them do. And foreign key like referential integrity constraints. Not all databases support those either, but if you're going to add that, uh, it's it's useful for ensuring you know, there are no bugs in your, uh, in your program logic. So how do you create consistency? And remember, this is consistency in the ACID sense, not in the CAP theorem sense. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're provided with A, I, and D. And C is your layers 
responsibility. So how do you do that? So in the example today, we're going to talk about a simple SQL-like schema. It's not about any, it's not about any particular database. It's just a logical model that we're going to think about. So it's, it's a bit oversimplified, but it's not too far off. And I think the record layer talks gave you a lot of information about how to productionize that type of thing. Um, so more definitions. Because again, there's, these words are overloaded in a lot of domains. So what do I mean by a database? I mean a named container for tables and some other things that I'm not going to talk about, uh, but we're just going to talk about tables today. Um, a t what is a table? A table is a named container for indexes and attributes. What is an index? It's a description of how you transform a record uh, into some type of key that you're going to index and what you're going to store in the value. And an attribute, I think you all kind of get that. It's some field on some record and that you're defining at the layer of, of the table. What's a foreign key? I kind of talked about that before, but, but you, you need a way to manage the life cycle and the relationship between records across tables. A lot of databases enforce that using, enforce that using an index under the hood, even if you don't have one. Uh, not all, I mean, it's not in theory required, but uh, that's a common way to do it. So using the tuple layer, which is basically the, the thing that you get in the bindings in order to structure your keys, which is a good idea to use, the, you could think about modeling this as you've got a database called school, it's got a table called students, and an index that is the primary index. And the, the value that you store in this index key, which I'm gonna explain a little bit more, is the, the value for that ID column. And you, you can see this structure over here. I, I'm gonna use this throughout the, the rest of the section of the talk. Each one of those blocks is some component in a, in a tuple. And the way that I've, the, the insight here that I think is, may not be obvious is that uh, if you're trying to think about how you model a SQL database is the primary index is an index like any other index. And you can put data in there like any other index and it's not, uh, it's not necessarily some special thing. So this is the kind of creativity you have to have when thinking about how you're gonna, how you're gonna model things. So what about a non-primary index? That's another index too. And as an aside here, the, the long names in the components of the, the tuple are just for illustration purposes. You're not gonna actually do that in a real layer until maybe you would with Redwood prefix compression. Um, but today you'd probably use something like the directory layer to turn those into shorter prefix codes or something that you do yourself. There's a benefit to doing this besides just prefix compression that I'll, I'll talk about later. So remember when I said what an index is. It's some rules for transforming a record into a key that you put in an index and a value that you store. This index is a non-unique index. You can imagine some other person with my name and some zip code I used to live in that is also indexed in this table. So you need to store the uh, primary key for the record at the end. So if you imagine there's another person named Brian that lived in zip code 10075, they could have primary key two and they could both live in the index so that when you do a range scan, you get both records. So this is the, the difference between a unique and a non-unique index key. On a unique index, you wouldn't put the primary key necessarily in uh, at the end of the key. There's, this is you know, things that you can choose to do, but it's a, a method of ensuring that your index is unique. It's not about enforcing the rule. That's something that you do in your code, but this is just a way to structure the key. You'd still presumably go read that key and make sure that it actually doesn't exist before you just blindly write to it. That's not the point of what I'm trying to illustrate, just, just the key structure. Yeah, so you, you want to keep the, the, the last value uh, in the key as the, the primary key just, again, so that when you do a range scan, you get them all back, then you can dereference them on the base table. This was covered in the, the CouchDB talk today, and it's, it's very important. If your users expect your data uh, to come back in some, some order that's like, uh, a sort order that's, that's for their native language. It's not just the byte order. 
you need to support uh, collation, is what it's typically called, where uh, you would store some type of a representation that goes through something like ICU to turn it into a, a key that sorts well in, for the database, but then you need to also store the representation that the user would see. That's important for, basically if, you're, if your app is gonna be used by people that don't just speak English, you need to, you need to do that. So CockroachDB, which is a, a SQL database built on top of a key value store, has some uh, documentation about how they do this, which is very good because it's like a real thing that works in the world and it has lots of details, just like the record layer um, that, you could, that you could go check out. Um, and I'm gonna re-upload a new version of the slides if you saw them. It doesn't have this in it, but it will soon, so you don't need to take a picture or whatever. Uh, yeah, so this, I'm, now I can explain to you why, why you would necessarily, not just for prefix compression benefits, want to put some type of indirection between the name of a table, for example, and the, the ID of a table. So if you wanted to support renaming a table or any other logical schema object, you don't want to have to rewrite the whole thing just because you stuck it in the key. That would be annoying. Uh, so there, there are benefits as well uh, to to being able to do that type of renaming and, and you know, remapping it to some, some ID, the scheme object. Another feature that you may want in your layer is non-blocking schema changes. The uh, consistent metadata management feature added in 6.1 makes this much easier than it would have been in the past, so I can actually explain it in, in 30 minutes. So when I say consistent, again, Moving the database from one valid state to the other. Consistent in terms of the metadata management is a, that's the, the cap theorem type consistency. But that's the one I'm talking about right now. So an index must not return false negatives by allowing queries before it is fully built. That is a rule. How does the metadata version feature help? So if you version stamp the metadata object that, uh, or excuse me, if you, if you update the metadata object and update the metadata version key at the same time, you can, you know, as was described in the lightning talk, keep, a, keep the history of the metadata and, and cache it in your layer so you don't have to repeatedly read it out of the database and cause a hotspot. It's stored at that key, which everyone saw earlier today. And you use this to signal that metadata has been changed in your layer. Again, this is stuff that you've already seen. Um, you, it's, it's free to get this key. That's another I, thing that I want to emphasize. It's free to get this because it's, it's sent to you automatically when you start a transaction in, uh, in starting in 6.1. So the, the paper that I think Alex referred me to originally uh, about, <laughs> about how to do this uh, is online asynchronous schema changes in F1 uh, from, from Google. It's, it's, F1 is their, their basically their SQL layer that works on top of Spanner, which you know it's roughly in a similar situation as you would be in FoundationDB, so it, it makes sense. It's a little bit tougher for them because they don't have that notion of a metadata version. So the paper goes into lots of complicated rules about how to do this if you didn't have the metadata version. Luckily, you can just implement the state machines in the paper and it's a lot easier. So I'm gonna just describe adding an index. There's a whole bunch of other ones that you can do that I'm not gonna describe. Um, but basically, you, you have to update the schema object and the metadata version in the same transaction to signal that the schema has changed. You're doing this in a transaction, it's atomic, just like anything else. So you set the initial state to write only, and this means it's invisible to reads for other transactions that are going on. Why does it have to be invisible to reads? Because it's being built. That means if you served reads from it, it could serve false negatives. So as, uh, as new transactions start after the metadata change happens, they do write into this index. Again, they don't read from it. Uh, and same thing for, for updates and deletes. And in the background, you, you, know, you do a back, some type of a backfill job to, to add the new, the new records. And one way to fulfill this is to store the version of the metadata that an object was written with so that you know if it's like from the older, the new version of the schema, and you can do a big scan in the background and, and add it to the index. Yeah, so you, you use that version to detect like if it's from before or, before or after. 
The, the background scan, that's something that uh, Nicholas just mentioned, is going to be more parallel in the future version of the record layer. So um, again, you can reference the record layer for how to implement these bits efficiently. So when you're finished with that background scan and, and indexing all the records, you can update that metadata again along with updating the metadata version to say the index is ready for read-write traffic. And then you're done. And this is a lot more, this is a lot simpler than what was described in the paper because you don't, like you have access to that consistent metadata version. Another feature that you may want to implement because it's commonly requested by business people is to have change data capture so you can audit changes to your tables. Um, the goal of this is to log the before and after version of every record that's inserted into the database uh, in the order that they were changed in some type of a log structure. Those of you who understand FTB will understand that this is hard. This is not a thing that like, you just get for free. Um, and that's why I'm giving you a warning that if you do this, you really have to understand what you're doing and, and do some careful capacity planning because this is basically like append only type structure. And if you fall behind while you're moving this around, say you're gonna you know, write it and then periodically move it into some other system, uh, if you fall behind, you will run out of disk space very rapidly. So how could you implement this uh, in FDB? Again, this, is, this has performance implications, but uh, depending on how valuable it is to you, this is a thing that you can do. So before you write to a key which represents a record logically, like in the primary index of the table, you read it first. So again, this has performance implications because you have to do a read before you do write, and it also has conflict implications potentially. You store the new, uh, the new version of the record and the old version together in another value in some log looking thing using a version stamped operation. Uh, and the reason that you can't do the read uh, concurrently with the write or after is because of the read your writes cache will like, you'll just get back the value that you just wrote and you, that, will not, that will be invalid for our goal here. So when I, when I say old and new, I keep saying those words, what do, what do those mean? Old or new, before and after, this is basically the same, the same thing. For an insert, uh, before is null because it's a new record and the after is the inserted record. If you've seen the MySQL bin log uh, or any type of other database change log, that's, it, it should be somewhat familiar to you, but an update, the before is the old value, after is the new value, that one I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, for a delete, the old, uh, the old value, the before value, um, excuse me, the before is the old value and the after is null because the record no longer exists anymore. So how would you implement something like this? Uh, this is, again, a, a simplified key structure. But the, the primary index and the change data capture index are, they're again, they're, they're just indexes. And you can take the old, on the top you're imagining you, you read out that old value, you're gonna update it to the new value. You would write into the change data capture index with a version stamped operation, both the old and the new value, such that you know, in the future you can go back and read it out in order. So, Another thing, if you're familiar with FoundationDB, you have to try to avoid write hotspots. You need to structure your, your writes to write to multiple ranges at once so that you don't over, overload one storage server. In order to read this log back out, you have to read every one of the partitions, uh, starting between whatever version you're trying to read and up to that, that future version. So this is a very naive way to, to do that, just to spread the data out, pick a random number, mod by the number of partitions. There's many more fancier schemes that you could come up with, especially if you wanted to keep records from the uh, related records in the, same, in the same logical partition. Oh, the reason why it should be a power two is because in theory you can split and merge uh, the number of partitions you have based, based, on, based on that. If you don't pick a power two, that's harder to do. So a feature request that I have, which may be, uh, it's, it's somewhat related to things that are going on for backup, but um, exposing the, the data on the T logs to applications may be useful. Um, some people may find it easier than, than implementing this thing. It doesn't let you get the before images, but it lets you get the after images, which is maybe more valuable to some people than the before. Um, you could also implement this thing on the storage server. All again, that's kind of crazy. Um, and it's, it's not free. 
but that's another spot that could that can implement this for you as a, a change feeds type uh, type feature. This breaks the key value abstraction once again uh, in favor of efficiency for uh, for a high value use case. Now, it's arguable if this is high value for for you or not, but that's just a a common theme, especially with the the query push down feature that was that was talked about this morning uh, by Evan. It's it's breaking the abstraction in favor of a little bit of efficiency. So on to the, the, the second half, or last third, I guess, however you want to call it. But let me describe to you why Amazon S3 is, is not fun to work with. It has a lot of limitations. These are quotes from the documentation. Amazon S3 offers eventual consistency for overwrite puts and deletes in all regions. That doesn't sound good. I'm not going to read this one, but but basically, it, it just says that object listing is not consistent. Uh, again, not fun to work with if you want to work directly against S3. This one is not obvious at all. And if you make a request to S3 for an object that doesn't exist, and then you write into that object, so you're speculatively hoping that an object will be there at some point, future reads on that key will have eventual consistency. I don't know why. It's just a thing that it is. Maybe they fix it and don't update the documentation, but uh, yeah, it's something you gotta live with. This is, ba this is basically the, the, the killer. Um, there's no conflict resolution that, like it's not, there's no locking. Basically, if you simultaneously try to write to the same key, you better hope your timestamp is later for the thing that you wrote, otherwise somebody else wins. Um, the thing I'm going to talk about is that, uh, that object locking mechanism. That's so somewhat of what we're, we're going to build, but FoundationDB takes care of that, uh, that bit for you. So what can you do with S3? Like what, what actually does it give you? Assuming you read only already written keys, and you know for a fact that they were already written, <laughs> and assuming you never update them, you get consistent read after write. That's basically the only thing. You do not get consistent listing at all uh, in any way. So that's not a lot. If you want to operate directly against S3, that's, that's hard to deal with. So how do we fix listing? This one is kind of easy. You just write all objects to S3 first. And I'll describe a little bit more about how you do that. And then you write a pointer to that object into FTB. So if you perform your, your equivalent of S3 list operations, using only foundation DB get range requests, you get consistent object listing. Now there's, there's lots of more details that you can go into about this to describe exactly the, the semantics that you want, um, but, but that's, the, that's the gist. But that's not the only thing. We need, we need a little bit more to, to make this work. So I'm gonna also assume you don't care about garbage collecting failed uh, puts to S3. You can imagine some scenario in which you successfully write to S3, and you're going to go then write it to Foundation DB, but Foundation DB is unavailable, so you have like some garbage data in S3 now. Um, that's fixable, but not that interesting. So the way that you write objects now in S3 is you just pick some UUID key that is you know random, long, unique, and you wait for S3 to acknowledge the request, and then you write that real key that you're trying to write your object to uh, into FDB along with that pointer to S3. Uh, now you could do something like conditional writes, uh, like Google Cloud Storage can do, uh, based on the metadata. And the reason Google Cloud Storage can do that is because Google Cloud Storage is backed by Spanner. So how do you read out of this structure? You just go to FoundationDB first, read the key, and then you read the pointer out of S3. So it's a slightly, slightly more latency, but really not that much. S3 is not particularly fast to begin with. So how do you delete data out of this? Uh, you, you add the pointer that was stored in that key into some type of queue that will ensure that it is eventually deleted, and then you delete the key from FoundationDB. All of what I just described is basically how you can wrap some other system in a, a, you know, a shell of FoundationDB that protects it from all of its bad, you know, bad spots and lets you um, 
get more features that make it easier to program against. So if you, you can imagine some type of analytics application that works against data in S3 that previously would have had to deal with these artifacts of eventual consistency by like retrying until it saw what it expected to see, um, all kinds of other, other tricks that now it could somewhat avoid. So go build stuff. Thank you.